This is the Remove the Guesswork podcast. Hello, welcome back to the Remove the Guesswork podcast. I'm your host, Leanne Spencer. My guest this week is Alessandro Ferretti. and This is a longer episode, but it is well worth it. Um, we talk about all kinds of things, such as the power of routine, the links between sleep, nutrition, body composition and mental health. Uh, why Alessandro left London um, to set up home in the Cotswolds in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we also talk about some of the common mistakes he sees people making with sleep and common mistakes he sees people making with nutrition as well. This show is packed full of value, but it's a little bit longer than our normal show. Um, a bit about Alessandro. He graduated from the Institute of Optimum Nutrition in 2001 and he and his partner Jules formed a company called Equilibria Health Limited. And they're a growing team of nutritionists and a medical doctor, and they're recognised as one of the UK's leading providers of nutrition education. Um, Alessandro also delivers a series of, of UK lecturers, uh, and I actually first met him delivering a lecture a couple of years ago. And he's a very well regarded nutritionist. He also calls himself a food behavioural doctor. Um, this is a great show. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. I link to everything in the show notes that we talk about, so don't worry too much about taking notes. But in parts, it's a little bit technical, but I think you're going to get a lot of value from this. So enjoy the show. Alessandro, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, you and I spoke of, of a couple of weeks ago, and you started to tell me the story of why you left London. And if, if, if you're OK with that, I'd really like to start there, because I think it's, it's a great story. <laughs> Um, sure, absolutely. Um, I'll give you the nutshell version uh, for the sake of your audience. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I used to work in a medical team in Harley Street at the Centre for Health and Human Performance. And um, that was one of my uh, little dreams, obviously, to, to have as a nutritionist, as a science-based nutritionist, by the way. And um, unfortunately, my body didn't seem to like London. I, I couldn't I couldn't pinpoint exactly what it was, but I, the problem was a, a cumulative effect of uh, London lifestyle. So uh, as we will go through later, um, I used to track different variables from heart rate variability to heart rate to glucose level, fasting and daily averages. And in a nutshell, the more time I spent in London, the more these variables were not optimal, um, ending up to a point where I had to take a drastic action. So I moved out a bit and did uh, this kind of test um, where for a certain amount of time, I carried out pretty much, uh, well, very similar work, uh, same diet, same, 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 and variable got dramatically better. And I did this three times. <laughs> and what, what were the variables? Um, the main ones I was monitoring was basically inflammatory response to sympathetic activation. So heart rate variability. So bloods, obviously I had blood tests done. Mm. Uh, but I could track every day where heart rate variability, really simple method. You can go onto my website and look all the videos. They're all free. So yep. you know, not I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. Sure, sure. Um, and uh, fasting glucose level. Okay. And uh, it kept, obviously, my diet hasn't dramatically changed in the last five to six years. Uh, unfortunately, um, especially in my case, given perhaps uh, a certain predisposition for an increased stress response in an environment where there is lots of stimulation, my body will activate a sympathetic response perhaps more than others. Yeah, and for clarity, a sympathetic response is your traditional fight flight as opposed to parasympathetic, which is more of the classic rest digest. So I, I think I'm right in yeah. saying, Alessandro, sympathetic, we want to be in that some of the time. Um, for exercise and inevitable stress, but not too yeah. too much. Is that correct? That that that's correct. I mean, the, the body has to. The, the the body. One of my greater scientist research colleagues always used to say to me, "You need a certain amount of stress to get you up Monday morning," mm. and that's the whole concept of Hermesis, where 
we provide the body with stressors in order to try to get better. Unfortunately, the constant activation of this system can potentially lead uh, to a derangement of how the body uh, should be working optimally. And it is the fight flight, but it shouldn't be fight flight all the time. Mm -hmm. So we can be happily sympathetically activated, engaging in activity, um, and then resting and recovery, which is your parasympathetic. Uh, however, um, certain people seem to be more susceptible to be constantly in that state of, of uh, I call it hyper alertness mm. uh, or hyper vigilance or hyper arousal. Different scientists give it a different name. However, if and when chronic activation of this will reach a certain limit, anything above that, then there will be consequences in our physiology. Yeah, got it. It's, it's not a bad process at all. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, cortisol, which is one of the hormones released uh, during this activation, is part of something called glucocorticoid. It's a really useful hormone. Unfortunately, if it's if it protracted over a period of time and also just within the day, this would interact with our rest and recovery later on in the day. You've got different variables from your your second yeah. set of, of tests. Yeah, yeah, I was starting to, to, to see that uh, other markers were on the rise. So, for example, there is a, a marker which now has been recognized to be a very important cardiovascular marker, but generally, you know, it, it, like, it, it affects many different pathways in the body called homocysteine. Uh, mine kept creeping up uh, regardless my diet was, you know, Pretty, pretty spot on. I'm, I'm a nutritionist at the end of the day. <laughs> I should, uh, I should at least get the basics right. Yeah, yeah, that's reassuring uh, to hear. Yeah, um, and um, uh, CRP were starting to increase, but my my main concern, which is how I started this journey, was that with a very good diet, uh, organic when possible, no hardly any refined form of foods, including carbohydrates or sweets, none of all of that, uh, practicing sports on a very regular basis, and being aware of my environment, my fasting glucose level kept creeping up. Mm. Uh, do consider that uh, anything, so after six, someone would be classified pre-diabetic. Uh, this is, would be six millimolar. And in some of the latest period, my of me being in London, my glucose was around five, seven constantly. Right. So it would have been three months. And, and you think, okay, if I would be someone that is uh, obese or overweight with, with a very poor diet, not exercising, that would be totally justified. So 5.7 would be absolutely normal. But in my case, I didn't have any leeways of, of movement in order to try to improve it. I, you know, I could have gone from, I don't know, six broccolis a day to eight uh, for a little bit more of nuts and seeds, a little bit more of green leafy veg, some changes in the protein, but it would have not brought my fasting glucose level down nowhere near that amount that I needed to be considered uh, a more healthy range. Mm. So for clarity, you were exercising frequently um, yep. You were eating, you know, as you would expect a nutritionist, you were eating well, and yet yep. still that that fasting glucose, which is the amount of blood glucose in your, or the glucose in yep. your blood, was still yep. elevated. Okay. That's correct. Yep. That's correct. Okay. Um, Carry on. Glucose is considered fasting glucose level is considered a, a, a is not an end result. It's a proxy. Um, most of the times, it's a good proxy for uh, insulin resistance. Uh, or, or basically how, how the body, is, how efficient is the body in order to clear glucose from the bloodstream. And that's the reason why I chose fasting because I knew that foods the previous day might have not had an impact on the fasting day, on the fasting glucose the following day. Um, 
there are other ways of you know using glucose as a proxy like postprandial so someone eats and measures the curves however this is all a little bit more advanced but um i think if someone tracks fasting glucose level um they can have generally a very good idea on how metabolically efficient their body is and to a certain extent uh, merging that va variable with heart rate variability that they can get a pretty good picture on how efficient the body is. Mm. So would you expect that the higher the heart rate variability, the more in control um, fasting glucose levels are? Um, yes, to, to, to a certain degree. So the, 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 uh, in my research project was an N equal 37. So I took 37 people all following within certain uh, uh, criteria which were no disease, not, not, not being diagnosed of any form of uh, hypoglycemia, insulin resistance in the last six months, not on medication. Uh, so what we would classify healthy individuals, the age were between 26 and 48. And uh, what was really, uh, really interesting was that despite the diet, I still had found people that were not aware of being just knocking at the door of pre-diabetic mm -hmm. ranges, um, and that was that was, in a way, a little bit of a wake-up call, uh, because now I do that as a routine. So the correlation between the heart rate variability and the glucose is minus uh, 0.78, so is a decently strong one. However, what we soon realize is that sometimes the sympathetic activation that will affect heart rate variability might not affect blood glucose, but also vice versa. So sometimes we find people with very good uh, heart rate variability uh, compared to their mean, and yet the glucose was elevated. Mm. This would include, for example, couple couple of Olympians. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that was the biggest shock, by the way, because you think that, you know, in Olympian, they have private nutritionists, they have exceptionally, they have coaches for the training, they have culture for the lifestyle. Uh, and yet, uh, especially in one of them, which obviously I can't mention the name, but is a current Olympic athlete in the GB team. Um, what was interesting is that the person had 30% over a period of a month of their fasting glucose level readings in the diabetic range. Wow. Yeah, you yeah. didn't expect that. Yeah, 70 were 70% 70 will encompass the pre-diabetics and diabetics. So uh, that doesn't leave us. So basically, uh, just under a third of the readings, this person's reading, uh, were classified as optimal, mm. which yeah, is a concern. Super, yeah, it's startling. And what did you put that down to? Well, the 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 main reasons for the in in these specific events was a, a form of chronic inflammatory response, and perhaps desensitization to certain uh, hormones uh, in order for these hormones to exert their anti-inflammatory effect. Mm. So. Uh, the body is exceptionally clever, and what, what, what I tend to consider is that the body is able to withstand stress amazingly, um, especially the stress that is quite acute. So someone is going on with their lives, there is a substantial stressor from their environment, wanted to physiological, psycho-emotional, whatever that may be. There is a big curve, acute response, everything is mobilized, and then it goes back to the mean. However, this is not quite our daily lifestyle, especially in metropolis, because we have one deadline, following by another one, following by another one, following by children, following by, and there is this constant uh, protractions of event that will keep this load uh, very high. In fact, I don't call it stress anymore. We call it life load. Yes. Yeah. Because the combination stress people associate, I associate it with work or with that call 
with someone that wasn't very pleasant or whatever. Unfortunately, is a little bit more comprehensive than that in my in our views, because the life load is the sum of all the things, all the loads that the person has in their lives. And that's the reason why I hardly, we hardly ever seen a professional athlete that also has another job being successful because the load is too high. Some of these people train twice a day for five days a week. So it, it's, it's a very different paradigm than, you know, someone. And, and that's the reason why I think what you are doing with your podcast is, is absolutely fantastic because when, when I used to go into corporate to try to, 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 to support whatever was the company in, in, in the employee's health, especially the upper management team, th their schedule was insane. Yeah. And also in a way very similar to me when I was in London, because after we finished with our patient, we had meetings and then we had more meetings and it was a constant activation. And at the end of the day, the body wasn't recovering. So if we add to that, some form of light and simple form of what we call active recovery exercise, fantastic. However, if we add a more substantial load from exercise, this is where I think people will get into troubles. Mm. So just by looking at perhaps um, the life load that someone would have, um, maybe in Olympic athlete where the load was different and maybe was a, a, a kind of an excessive load coming from the training perspective, we modified the diet, we spoke to the coach in relation to the training and things within less than just under six weeks started to be very, very consistently optimal. Yeah. But unfortunately, this is not normally the case because people may not even be aware that the fasting glucose level is elevated. Yeah. And yeah. this is one of the problems. I guess it's not something that a lot of people necessarily check. Um, and the other thing is on life load. I think our, our expectations of what a normal and acceptable life load is have become quite skewed. You know, people have ta taken on a lot um, because there's always someone else they can look to to say, well, they've got even more to do and they seem to cope. I should be able to. Therefore, yeah. I'm just going to push on. You know, I think our yeah. expectations on ourselves are massive now. It, it's, um, it, uh, I think you nail it because, so for example, I have colleagues and patients in the Far East and I have also colleagues and patients in, in the US. So technically, I could easily work 24 hours a day, mm. all the way around the clock. I have a seminar tonight at my 10 o'clock. And this morning at 6.30, I was um, interacting with one of my patients in Singapore. Mm. And yet, at the same time, I'm, I'm, uh, the, 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 it's a multidisciplinary kind of approach to this patient. So the coach is in New Zealand. So you can easily see that nowadays, especially with, 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 with how the power of internet and and how flexible our work has become. People can work constantly. And the perception is that if you don't work a certain number of hours, you're lazy or, you know, you're not being productive or, well, uh, I, I studied counseling and psychotherapy only for a couple of years at a certificate level, nothing, nothing major, but it was really, really powerful to connect emotions to what happened physiologically in the body because I was studying nutrition at the time as well. So I could actually see the stuff that is in the head as we would divide it here in the, in the West. Um, and then what was actually happening what would it mean when someone has very high level of serotonin and dopamine not supported by noradrenaline? Yeah. And so you, you actually see it, it starts to make a lot of sense. And unfortunately, nowadays, what also some people are required to do 
as part of the job description is is quite interesting <laughs> because I wouldn't sign for that. <laughs> no. So yes, I think. Um, um, and what, what surprises me is that some of these people, especially brokers, I, I, we tend to deal sometimes with brokers in our other side of the business, um, and brokers, they know, so I'm going to do this for 10 years. I know I'm going to be completely shattered at the end of it, but once I've done that, then I can relax. I think, okay, I would really advise you to perhaps have a check of two years into this 10 years goal that you have because you want to get at the end of the 10 years that you are able to relax. Mm. I wanted to come back to something you just said about the connection between the emotional um, aspect of ourselves and the body. And I think, yeah, there's a very well proven and profound link. And a yeah. basic example of that is deep breathing can help change your physiology. Um, you know, there's a, it's a strong connection. But how does, it, how does nutrition interact with those two things? Oh, um, that's really interesting. The, 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 the book I'm, I'm currently writing, and I won't mention title, so this is not a plug. Um, <laughs> you can plug it if you like. Well, it's not ready yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, I'm, coming soon. Yeah. Um, the, the, I tend to consider four to five big areas of our health that can dramatically impact on our health. And I'm going to take a little bit of a dig to all the most recent uh, books where they guarantee whatever goals the person has buying that specific book in three to four weeks, in 21 days, mm -hmm. into whatever. Because these books keep referencing things that normally happen in blue zone countries. So blue zones are um, uh, hotspots where uh, people live happily over a hundred. Right. And it's a really lovely book. And it was really interesting about the book is the two people that kind of put it together, they didn't know anything about, or not a lot about health. They were scientists and they would basically say, okay, what are the commonalities between these people that actually live a lot? And what was really interesting is that it wasn't a vegan diet, it wasn't a meat-eating diet, it wasn't a pescatarian diet. One thing was in common, which is high level of antioxidants from vegetables and plant sources, mm -hmm. but that does not make the person either vegan or vegetarian or meat-eater, because some of these groups had a lot of meat, some others had a lot of fish, some others were demi-vegetarian. So what's really interesting is the nutrition plays a part, but the more in line all other factors are in the person's lives, the least is the part the nutrition would play. I'm not sure if this makes any sense. I think so, yeah. So for example, let's assume someone sleeps very well. Let's assume someone has a good physical activity. So moving around physically and at the same time, not exercising six days in a week for three hours a day. So a, a balance activity. Mm -hmm. The level of life load is not too high. So what we call, what people would refer to stress. So work stress, family stress, partner stress, whatever that may be. In that case, diet may not play such a huge role. Of course, it will still affect the person's health. But if these three main factors are in line and the person does not develop any form of inflammatory, chronic inflammatory responses, then maybe the diet may not be so pivotal. That's fascinating. But, so what is keeping them afloat, if you like, then, in terms of their health? The movement? Well, the, it's a combination, in, in, in our view, is a combination between recovery, mm -hmm. lack of less sympathetic activation, and movement. So all three of them. Now, where is the threshold? Well, this is what we are trying to put into a paper, uh, into a system, in a, in a research project. We, 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 we're quite at sea uh, still uh, because it's really hard to define uh, where everyone is different. So, for example, you know, take me, uh, not as an equal one, but just as an example. 
um, in, in a certain environment, I'll thrive. No changes of any other variables in another environment, all my physiological variables will actually um, be not optimal at all. Which kind so, of brings us back to what we started on, actually. Exactly. Um, the story exactly. of, of you leaving London. So let's pick up from that, if we may. Sure, sure. I mean, that f for me was a kind of, uh, I was as excited as the guy that discovered hot water, really, uh, all the sliced bread, because I thought, I just got so excited for something that is so obvious. But it, I'll give you an example. So the journey into work. And I used to stay at Highgate. Um, I had a place at the back of the, uh, there is a reservation area, so not a lot of traffic, didn't hear anything from, 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 from where I stayed, from the flat, and et cetera, et cetera. And in the, it was a simple journey into Harley Street. And I then compare that to the journey <laughs> that I do <laughs> now where I live, which is, right in the middle of nowhere hence you and i had to arrange a day where my internet was right <laughs> yes well, thankfully so, so far so good exactly i mean the closest road to my house does not have road signs in in, in white lines or yellow lines does not have any line yeah that to give you an idea of what is the difference so i see one day i counted 172 billboards to get into Harley Street. That's a lot of advertisement that the brain has to process. Mm, wow. That's a lot of movement. That's a lot of decision. All of that impact in something called a thinking latitude. I'm sure that some um, uh, psychotherapists or psychologists are, 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 will, will be terrified on how I am expressing this. However, what I'm trying to say is the brain will be idling at a very different speed from me doing my forms first thing in the morning when I take the dogs out. So you're it's saying a, that the, the brain has got so much to process, so many distractions, so many decisions to, start, to make. Just to start with. In that busy environment, yeah. yeah in I that busy environment. So any, any time the person makes a decision, especially depending upon what this decision means for them, so for me, driving, I used to rally drive. So for me, driving is relaxing. Take exactly the same drive in exactly the same car. Someone else could be very, very stressful. Mm. And this is why when people say the, the, the um, uh, HPA axis, which is the, the famous hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis. So basically what is activated during the stress response, I add an A at the start because it's, it, to me, amygdala is exceptionally important because what could be a stressor for me may be relaxing you. Hmm. So you do a certain type of meditation, I go bananas, it just winds me up. If I practice my, my forms really slowly in a very pose and control manner, right in the middle of the wood, then to me, nothing can get close to a substantial increase in heart variability during that performance. Yeah. So for, for clarity, is, heart rate variability is the beat, the interbeat interval, isn't it? And a healthy heart does not have a regular interbeat interval. It has an irregular interbeat interval. Yeah, is that yeah, correct? Yeah. 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 yeah that, 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 that's correct. So the, 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 the more relaxed seemingly the, 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 the heart is meaning the sympathetic is not taking control of the heart system, let's call it, um, the, the more are some subtle variations within the heartbeat. And I'm talking, you know, fraction of a second, not, you know, uh, it's not arrhythmias, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah. yeah, gotcha. So, and how yeah. can people track their heart rate variability? Oh, Easy. They, they, nowadays, they, they, the, the tracking of these, the, 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 everyone can, 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 can the start, they can start from free apps all the way to track it professionally in corporate as we used to do uh, with ongoing monitoring systems in the thousands. So 
Um, generally speaking, um, a, a phone app is more than sufficient. Uh, I tend to use mainly two. Um, and, you know, if you want, I can mention it. But all of these are actually, uh, I just done an updated few videos on my website as well. So yeah. I mean, feel free to mention what you use. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, uh, for general population, I use something called Elite HRV or yeah. Bombwork. Got it. I'll link to that in the show notes. Yeah, I, I've and, used yeah. that as well. Uh, right. Okay. There is another one that is perhaps more suited for uh, sport, which is HRV for the number training, or one word. Yeah, okay. HRV for training, where four is a number. Okay, got it. That gives all sort of statistics and things, and it, it's it, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, but um, any of these two can 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 work. On the Elite HRV, you may have to buy a sensor, and they're just launching their own sensor, which is. Uh, I'm just about hopefully to receive uh, soon to test it out. Otherwise, uh, people may want to consider buy something called Aura Ring, O U R A. Yeah, where I'm they wearing wear one. Oh, there you are. Okay, yeah. so am I. Um, and and that will give them a baseline. May not be as as uh, you know absolutely minutely precise as the two snapshot but also they give different information so you can't quite compare the two the beauty of the order is compliance you put it on and then every two days you charge it and you forget you have it and every morning you get a score yeah it's in an amazing bit of kit actually and what i also yeah. love about it we haven't touched on sleep yet but it is yeah. extremely accurate for sleep sleep composition sleep duration sleep latency it's it's a fabulous bit of kit I've, I've mined six months of data out of these 37 individuals and people that had their aura. I was ecstatic. It's treble the work because I was mining the data, looking not just at the final score. I was looking at REM, deep sleep, interruptions, disturbances, and et cetera. So I mined the whole sleep and really, really interesting patterns mm. in relation to fasting glucose level. If there is one thing that probably I would make sure that people focus would be sleep, but quality sleep. Yeah. Someone that comes to me is up on me asking them, how's your sleep? And they say, oh yeah, it's all right. To, to my slight OCD brain, that doesn't mean anything. It, 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 I, I struggle to compute that. <laughs> yeah, and I think people's idea of what a good night's sleep is has changed. Um, I read a statistic. Um, I, I cannot remember the source, but I think it's something to the effect of we're sleeping an hour less than we used to. And yeah. I have frequent conversations with people about how they sleep. Yeah, not bad. And when you drill down into it, they're up twice then for the night in the loo. Um, yeah. For the loo in the night, sorry. Uh, they are waking very early, sometimes not being able to get back to sleep, but on balance they feel okay. And hey, their mate doesn't sleep that well either. So again, it's our new normal. It's, 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 it's a really odd one. And, and going back to your question, Leanne, so you can imagine that someone that doesn't sleep well, that doesn't really move or exercise and has very high level of stress, then diet becomes exceptionally important. Right. Because the other three are completely out. So the diet takes then a major role in maintaining the person's health or trying to maintain the person's health. And this is should 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 really um, resound with well with with people say oh you know my grandpa drank and smoked and ate whatever and he was fine until ninety. I said yes, but so next question is what was his life load? Was he physically active and what was his sleep? Mm. All the generations seems to have these three pretty nailed down. Yeah. Amazing. They would have done more physical work, generally yeah. speaking. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, that that is a big, it's a big health risk uh, working in certain environments in the metropole, and 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 I and I see this every time I I, I I lecture, and this is not just UK. When I lecture in the US or wherever I am, it's the, in the metropole. You see, you see so clearly 
um, even just by sitting in a coffee shop and just looking out, which by the way, you are considered a freak if you do that. <laughs> because you're not on your laptop, on your phone or talking or yeah. doing something, then, then you know, that, whereas the, 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 it, it's dramatically <laughs> evident if people just raise their head and actually look at the pace but then when they go back, they have other stresses. And then they try to squeeze in the last thing when they are alone, which is normally slightly later in the evening. So you can see that there is less and less time to actual sleep and the quality is heavily affected by what we do prior sleep. Mm. And that, that, that I think is, 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 is killing our nations. What are some of the common mistakes you see people making with sleep? Eating late, electronics and stimulation. Wow, that was a quick answer. Um, oh, we, me we measure that. We measure that. And that, that's the reason why is, is so I plotted all sorts of different graphs uh, and data. And I use also pivot charts and but I also use a program called R, R Studio. And that was fantastic. Um, the later the people, so ideally people need to leave between three to four hours, but four hours is ideal before retiring from the last main meal. Okay. Anything that will stimulate any form of sympathetic activation that is carried through from the day or even new one, I don't know, um, that will interact with how the person would naturally fall asleep, but also what we didn't know in the architecture of the sleep. And that was the big, you know, once again, sliced bread, yeah, hot water is it was the same thing. I said, well, of course it does, wouldn't it? By stimulating a certain type of activation, i.e. hormones, these hormones have a direct negative impact on the one that would prepare us to sleep. And there are all sorts of blogs in here. So what, one of the things that we, 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 we looked at is last time of eating and this, the ideal spot, the sweet spot would be six o'clock if someone would retire a, around 11, 10, 30, 11, which no one does. Most people eat at 8.30 and then go, back, go to bed around 11. Hmm. Uh, th that seems to directly affect fasting glucose level the following day, but not directly, indirectly by affecting sleep to then affecting the fasting glucose level. So, so you found that eating late impacts yeah. sleep, which has a negative impact on blood fasting glucose levels. In other Correct. words, they're elevated, which is not what we typically want our blood glucose yeah. levels to be doing. Yeah. Gotcha. People, okay. people, have the same training regime, the same, same uh, diet, the, the same, everything was same, same, same. Except obviously there would be some variables that we are not fully able to control. I totally understand that. However, given it long enough, the data does it, the data will normally would show it unless someone would out of the 37 people wanted to specifically sabotage our findings, which I don't think so. Yeah. But what was really interesting is that the eating late, the minimum reduction of the depth of the sleep in our subset was 50% on deep sleep. So if someone would eat late and then go to bed, especially if accompanied by alcohol, that would at least half the deep sleep, wow. which is one of the most restorative phases alongside REM. And that seems to have an effect on fasting glucose level. So that, that was the first one. The other one is the typical, you know, activation. What do you do for relaxing? I watch TV, brilliant, what do you watch? And that is an interesting answer <laughs> because I, I reached my, my, my highest relaxation watching certain programs, one of them which, for example, is MasterChef Australia. Right. You will go and figure it. It doesn't matter what it is, but it allows me to relax. And it doesn't really matter what it is as long as the person relaxes. And we measure that with an ongoing heart variability two-site sensor monitor that we, 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 we use at times in some individuals. And said, okay, well, you can tell me that you were relaxing watching TV, 
but your heartbeat does not tell me that. That's 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 there. It's science. <laughs> you were sympathetically activated until ten minutes prior going to bed, and your deep sleep was basically inexistent. Activation, work activation, emails, whatever that the person may may be engaged my sabotage, not so much the bed timing, but the architecture of the sleep. Mm. And that that's huge. Yeah. I, I get emails from people in the US at six o'clock in the morning and you think, hang on a minute. It's one o'clock or not far off where you are. <laughs> Which bit of not going to bed early did you not understand? <laughs> yeah. Uh, some some of the, the people I work with as well, it's it often the challenge is just tweaking or, or significantly changing some of that bedtime routine. Um, yeah. I have a concept called the sleep staircase, which I, I try and get people to buy into. But for me, it's as soon as I come in from work or I finish working from home, I'll start descending that metaphorical staircase towards bed. And each step is something like change into casual clothes, switch off uh, alerts, uh, eat a meal before 7.30. Sounds like we need to make that even earlier. Uh, put on the blue light blocking glasses, watch something relaxing, and so on and so on. All of awesome. which takes me down to bedtime. And more or less, that's what I maintain. And um, But sometimes, yeah, people have got some, you know, some really out of sync habits. And looking at electronics in the middle of the night because they can't sleep is another big one. Oh, that that's a disaster. That does add insult to injury. Have you got any uh, actual um, statistics or, or numbers around what electronic devices do to melatonin production? Oh, blimey, there, there, are, there, there are ample, uh, just in my, in, my, in my research collection program, I, I have a whole folder on it. Right. So the, 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 in a nutshell, it's dramatic uh, because it just changes the architecture of the sleep. So we have known that given a certain intensity of blue light. I know that people can start to argue, well, if I look at the phone, it's not that big. I have, you know, in, in some of the uh, recent software, there is a night mode. Okay, that night mode still does not, is not sufficient. We, we, I have a colleague that measured that with a spectrometer and it still does not stop the blue light. And the blue light, is the wavelength, by the way, not the color blue, right. <laughs> which mistake I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I looked like a right plonker <laughs> when I asked <laughs> the technician. Okay. Well, good, good to clarify <laughs> for the listeners and me. Yeah. <laughs> he said, right, we're talking about blue light frequency, not the blue color, which it can have a lot of blue light frequency in it. But and I went, right, I, I just asked a dumb question, didn't I? And went, yes. But say okay, fine. Let's move on. Um, and uh, what was uh, what was kind of once again uh, really bringing back to 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 simple things is that the the blue light affects one of the main hormones that prepares us to actually sleep. And if that is not optimal, then the architecture of the sleep is affected, which then affects our recovery, which then affects our physiology. So blue light blocking glasses is one problem, uh, but I would also argue that depending upon what is it that you do may have also a bigger or a smaller impact. So for example, if someone is replying to an email that is rather unpleasant, plus the screen, then they get a double whamming effect. Yes. They negative. Whereas someone is watching a TV and the TV is quite far away and maybe the wavelength isn't affecting too much melatonin, then maybe that wouldn't be the case for that specific person because the enjoyment of the program is still a routine that they have and maybe the effects of that are marginal. And this is actually was reflected in, in, the, in what we have measured. However, we, we made assumption based on what we measured because we did not go out and test that specifically. So I can't make major, I can't make inferences on that. Mm. However, if people Google uh, or Google Scholar Blue Light 
and melatonin in sleep, they find, I tell you something interesting, Re um, a few days ago, I came across, I was doing some research for a patient, and I came across a paper where mm. they actually use blue light in darkness to reset circadian rhythms in shift workers. Okay, go on. That, that was amazing uh, because I thought, well, how can we use something that isn't great and use it to our own advantage or the advantage of some people that don't really have a choice? Uh, or they like their job and you know they need to patch up a bit on their health. And they were actually using exposure to blue light in, in order to reset the circadian rhythm. And what was even more interesting, they also used meal timings. Right. Fantastic. So through the environment, looking at the light-dark cycle and meal timings, people had less deviation from health. And it, to me, was great because that summarizes some of the points that we have also observed that we didn't know we were going to be observing later on <laughs> because we didn't have that in mind in our research project, uh, but we also observe it in our, in our study. So were they using something like the human charger or retimer glasses? What were they using to get that blue light? They, yeah, they were trying to basically whoever whoever was um, uh, doing the, the study, so part of the subset population, they were they were using systems to uh, enhance a certain phase delay or phase advance, meaning to change the actual circadian rhythms to getting some rhythm. So mm -hmm. involved, interestingly enough, blue light blocking glasses. Um, and involve all. In fact, I uh, I ended up um, uh, contacting a, an optician in Cheltenham. It, that I said, look, I'm I'm going to do some work. Will you be able to actually stock some of these blue glasses because blue blocking glasses because um, you can get them very very cheap, but they look very cheap and they also they're not tested specifically for that. And now with between 80 and, and, and 100 pounds, people can get a very good quality from the UK, here in the UK. Now the, 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 the subdition actually stops them. Yeah, I, I actually saw that. It must have been on one of your social media channels. And again, I'll link to it in the show notes because I recommend blue, glass, blue light blocking glasses and wraparounds for people with prescription lenses all the time. And Correct. I used to get mine from Swanick via Amazon, but the wraparounds are out of stock. So I will link to that in the show notes because um, that's something yeah. I would recommend everybody wears in the evening no matter what you're doing yeah. blue light blocking glasses so you do your best to yeah. to allow melatonin to do its job which is preparing us for bed yeah and alongside with stimulants alongside with um, you know hyper arousals and activation or you know hyper engagement like as I said emails or horror <laughs> movie whatever, whatever the person so basically this is the power of routine the, you mentioned your staircase. I really wish my patient would embrace that visualization of every step because that consolidates a routine. And routine is even more powerful most many times of what is the actual action. Mm. So that for me is very, very different. Um, but guess what? It's still, call it staircase, call it routine, call it whatever, it doesn't matter is it, that that is one of the very very important things and through modifying the diet people can also have that routine consolidated so for example the vast majority of my carbohydrates comes during the day in the evening i mainly have fats lots of fiber from the vegetables and protein this is what i tend to have and my body kind of gets used to that and I tested this across different continents, especially flying east. And I maintained the same routine and anticipated the delay depending upon which way I was actually traveling. I thought, wow, this is amazing. Let's get some patients and they do the same journeys and testing on them. And inevitably, all of them found 
some substantial changes. However, you know what was the most profound change that had the highest correlation in our subset? Go on. <laughs> Watching the sunrise. Right. And that, that the, was what resets the, that the skin rhythm. Tell the body, now is the day, start. Yeah. And uh, this is sounding very fluffy, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that is what for us had the biggest correlation. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Mm. I mean, in the work that I've done, research that I've done, which is not to, to the degree that you're doing at all. So it's why it's so interesting to hear what you're saying. But but making sure you get as much natural light first thing in the day as possible, certainly from my personal experience, is, is, yeah. is absolutely pivotal uh, and will, you know, I like to say that my sleep, the, the quality of my sleep tonight uh, was already dictated in part by what I did when I woke up and the routine, you've mentioned that, that I have in the morning. Um, and getting that natural light in as quickly as possible is something that I recommend to everyone that we work with. Yeah, with well, day. I'm sure they are consistent with what we found. Um, yeah. And, you know, as I said, we, we don't have anything to sell or promote, but this is what we have observed. Mm. Uh, uh, it, it's it's it, it explains a lot about people working shifts or working too late into the evening or consequently not sleeping well or not seeing daylight during the first part of the day or eating in in when daylight is far gone mm -hmm. uh, one of the simplest rules i tend to advise is try to eat with daylight eat as much as you can with daylight and all not a lot away from obviously in the winter that becomes highly restrictive but <clears throat> you know eating again around six mm. six has shown to us to have a, a, a dramatic beneficial effect compared to the group that ate at eight or later right that's great so eat as much as you can within the confines of daylight yeah, yeah. I, lo I love that. And what are, just while on that, um, what are some of the other common mistakes you see people making with nutrition? With nutrition? Yeah. Uh, follow Faye diet without getting the basics right. That's yeah. the bite. This is what my book is about. Um, if you, if you, that's the reason why in a polite way, I, 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 I had a little dig to these books promising you know, lifelong health in 21 days. They, they, they kind of miss the point. Hmm. The point is that it's a combination of factors and the diet, a Mediterranean diet, guess what? Is more appropriate for Mediterraneans. Um, other diets are more appropriate for people that might have different genetic subset uh, of, you know, combination of genes and, and you know, we are not quite there yet on, on the whole research. And most of the studies done on that are purely by association. So we can't find causality yet. We're starting to, but we're way, way, way behind. But most of the times when I see people, oh, what do you think of, and they name you, one of the most recent trends in food, we, from goji berries to whatever. And you think, okay, so... Are you eating enough vegetables? Are you having a good quality level of protein? Is your food as close as you would find it in nature? Mm. I had a conversation with my son the other day and he said, uh, oh, can I have a packet of carrot sticks? And I think, hang on a minute. This looks nothing like a carrot stick. To me, carrot and a stick is a carrot that has been chopped. Yeah. Is not this fluffy, crisp, airy alike thing, I can't describe in any other ways, that they call carrot stick. It's got nothing to do with a carrot, except it's flavored with a carrot. And I said, okay, dude, we, we need to have a, we need to have a sit down here. <laughs> <laughs> carrot stick is you take a carrot, you brush it, you don't even have to wash it, you chop it, that is in sticks. That's a carrot stick. Yeah. And how far is that carrot from nature? Um, not very far. From how the person would find it in nature. Well, yes. not far, right? 
same thing, especially uh, meat. Minced meat has a very different load than the, exactly the same meat in a um, full form, in the form of a steak, for example. Fish fillet and fish fingers is exactly the same scenario. So from the time that we start to process the food, there are all sorts of um, uh, processes that would uh, potentially be detrimental. Where the, the, uh, a research, a group of research at the University of Leicester has actually found that despite the quality of the food, so even high quality food, just, just the processing can potentially lead bacteria even when refrigerated, when the food has been processed. So it doesn't matter if it's organic or non-organic, it doesn't matter. But going close as possible on how the food was found in nature, prepared, cooked and eaten within a certain amount of time and get the basics right, to me, are, are pro if people would do that, I think 70% of the people would not need any form of therapy or any form of counseling or any form of going and see someone hmm. about the diet. Because you think so, the link between nutrition and mental health is that strong? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it can be strong, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, knowing everyone, but definitely, so you have someone like, uh, like, like my son, that certain protein food will generate a huge um, endomorphic activation. And it will go in, in full withdrawal. So it would experience someone having a, a, a recreational drug withdrawal. So that, that's a serious mental health uh, concern. Yeah. But other people then certain exactly the same food may not bring anywhere near the case of activation that my son has and some other people might be gluten so i see an awful lot of people on a gluten-free diet thinking that is healthy and they couldn't be further from the truth mm. One, they can miss very important nutrients two what they replace it with and that's the problem i have because if you replace it with vegetables, brilliant. If you replace it with really clean food, which is naturally gluten-free, found in nature gluten-free, brilliant. But when people start to uh, replace gluten with these kind of Frankenstein foods, then I might consider that in some cases, unless celiac, People having the gluten that is good quality might not be as detrimental as far as gut is uh, There are emulsified, there are, there are things that to make these food palatable that unfortunately have been found to be quite detrimental. So even that, it has to be redesigned and rather than follow a trend, really start from the basics. And uh, I did, some, I did a, an ITV program some time ago, quite some time ago. And I took the, uh, it was a bariatric, so uh, we were doing obesity. So we took the four ladies uh, and I took them into a, a shop, in, uh, into a deli, a quite renowned deli in Malibu High Street. And what was, what was fantastic is that I didn't use any calorie, any portion control. I didn't use any of the traditional methods. I took a plate, a paper plate, and I drew it. I draw a line cutting it through. And I said, okay, half of this plate is from this section pointing at vegetables. The other half of the plate, I divide it in further two parts. So a quarter and a quarter. In one quarter, high quality protein. In the other quarter, some carbohydrates, fat sprinkled all with olive oil or have an avocado. That's all I've done. And it's really interesting that, you know, some, some of the prices that people charge in, in Harley Street to have something not that dissimilar from that. Mm. And, and the lady, not, what, what was fantastic for me as, as, as a nutritionist was that not only they achieved what they had to achieve in this program, um, it was called This Morning, I think, the program. Mm. But what was really interesting is that six months later when we went back, to actually check, the ladies were still losing a pound, pound and a bit 
every week. So they kept that as a routine. That was their new lifestyle. And all I've done is three simple basic principles. Yeah. There was no supplementation of, you know, 452 milligrams of magnesium or B6 or uh, some really strange weird diet. It was just really looking at the basics and really crystallizing these basics into their routine. Mm. I completely agree with you. I think for for any busy person who's who's lost their routine, got into bad habits, whatever it is, it's got to be simple. Sticking with the basics. It's something that if I said you're going to carry this on for the next three years, how do you feel about that? Yeah, I could do it. Um, and anything else that's faddy or fashionable just yeah. won't last. And I'm I'm dead against it. It's absolutely against our philosophies. And, and um, just to just to dot the i's and cross the t's here there are people that are truly sensitive and they should work with someone yep helps them in order to identify a specific and i'm going to say either cause or trigger so this is typical for gluten gluten has been shown to in a in a reasonably large number of people to create some form of reactions Okay, my question is, okay, so what would happen if the person would not have already a form of chronic inflammatory response present? And that is when it becomes really interesting. So gluten in some individuals may be the trigger that will manifest symptoms because of all sorts of other predispositions that the body has. But then they say that gluten is causality. And in this case, I don't agree with that. In some people, definitely is. They have a true immunological cascade of responses that will lead to an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But if people will be, let's say, healthy and not have a chronic uh, kind of degenerative inflammatory process present day in and day out, stress, poor sleep, and et cetera, et cetera, then gluten is not a cause of the symptoms. It's just the last straw that brought the camel's back. It's just the last step. In this case, it was gluten, because we have gluten two to three times a day as a minimum, most of the times. But it could have been something else. And this is where the danger is. So there are some people that are truly sensitive, and I'm not belittling this at all. I'm just saying that, I found a substantial number of people that instead of being on a gluten-free diet, they should have had more colorful vegetables and just they should have more vegetables full stop yeah. <laughs> and perhaps have less refined food. And if they have pizza or pasta of a good quality, nothing happens. And I'm one of them well, by the way. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I follow a predominantly plant-based diet. Uh, minimal refined carbohydrates. Uh, I've actually got this three token rule. So I've got three tokens for refined carbs, chocolate, sugar, uh, that I can have a week. So it feels permissive. Today I had a apricot Danish and that's my three tokens done for the week. So I, you know, I thought long and hard before using that last token and that, that works really well for me. So it's not a completely uh, perfect diet if such a thing exists. Plenty of water. I mean, I happen not to drink alcohol. Um, few fruits not too many uh, meat twice a week oily fish twice a week i also take a krill supplement um and that, yeah. that for me is the basics really it's just a lot of vegetables yeah and yeah they're, they're delicious lots of different colors textures you know it's yeah. yeah 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 however that takes commitment leanne if i may say because yeah i've worked up to that that, that has been a process <laughs> yeah. of a couple of years i spend most of my time in trying to not convince people what is good and what is bad, as I don't tend to say good and bad, mm. but in trying to develop healthy routines. So am I a nutritionist-ish? Um, I think I'm more of a food behavioralist. I don't think there is a, a qualification for that, but uh, this is where I got a bit more the, the, the merge of the uh, studies in counseling and psychotherapy and you know medicine with the nutrition because at the end of the day we're still habitual animals mm -hmm. and, and and if someone can if someone says to me what are you going to eat today i don't know but i open the fridge i automatically do it 
I don't have to think, oh my God, I need a recipe for this. And I need, whereas now you can see the value, which I would never have seen unless I would have studied it in microwave spaghetti. I could not understand. It takes eight minutes to cook them from fresh, right? Mm. What, what is the sense in sticking on the microwave for six and you have something out of a tin? And it didn't make any sense to me and, until someone said to me, I, when I get home, I do not want to think. I want one thought is to press on on my remote control and the other one on in the microwave. These are this is what I've got left. And we go back to the thinking latitude. Yeah. They had so many thought processes during the day that are mentally exhausted. And even thinking about what shall I chop automatically is an open question, requires more work. Um, obviously, um, I'm, uh, I'm exaggerating this, but it's not actually that far off. Because hmm. some people just want to go pre-ready meal. is a ready meal. Jamie Oliver, regardless you like it or not, has multiple time demonstrated that is not far off for roughly the same amount of price. Yet, what does he do? It's a chef. It requires preparation. Mm -hmm. And for people that they don't know about it, they need to go and search for a recipe. They need to follow something. They need to think more. And this is where do you put, you know, where do you put your eggs in which basket? Yeah. <laughs> in your work? or in your health basket or where where the, yeah. this is i Not, spend more time with my patients yeah yeah i love that i mean i we need to, to wrap up I'm mindful of your time but i've got a concept of an energy jar and it's something i only realized recently you've only got so much energy there isn't a pot for getting to work a pot for work and a pot for exercise and a pot for the rest of the day it's just one pot so you've got to eke it out and appreciate that if you've already blown half your energy on a tense working day you haven't got much yeah. left when you get home make the make, set it up so that you've got as few decisions to make as possible to keep these very simple so I, th I think we're very much on the same wavelength um you've given us loads of value thank you very very much for that just tell us briefly we never got to the end of your story but you left london um just just outline the setup you've got i'm, I'm very jealous outline the setup you've got there now <laughs> <laughs> I, I live uh, uh, just at the edge of the Cotswolds, so between Stratford and Avon and, and Broadway in the Cotswolds. Um, and uh, uh, I'm just basically surrounded by woods in a few minutes from a town uh, or village, even, uh, I should say. And uh, one of the biggest changes in my health was getting a dog. Well, two. Um, they, they, they force you to get in the daylight, despite the weather. They, they really mind. <laughs> um, they force you to stay out uh, and they force you to move. And it, it, it's really interesting how then you plan your habits around one healthy habit, just one. But that automatically prompts your day because it's okay, as soon as I wake up, I won't have anything to eat. I have my glass of water and et cetera, et cetera. And then I go out and do some very slow form of physical activity whilst the dogs chase pheasants and et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't hunt, by the way. I just, they try yeah. to chase. Yeah, gotcha. Um, and, <laughs> and, um, and then when I get back, I do, uh, I have a certain routine. I prepare my breakfast and, and then up until 11, generally I don't check certain emails or certain, certain uh, social channels. Um, and then once I have done that, so I get to 11 o'clock and basically I feel I have been already fairly productive. So if anything else goes wrong, then still okay. Mm. Uh, and and, the, and this, this looking out on woods, uh, is tremendously soothing for me. And I'm, I'm going a bit fluffy here, but I'm, I'm, it's, it's calming in yeah. whichever way you want to uh, see that. And uh, I wouldn't, right now, I wouldn't go back living in a metropolis uh, regardless what. Um, yeah, it's, this is what I love doing. Yeah, and technology enables us to do it. We've, we've bad mouthed tech a little bit or at least our habits around it. But it has enabled us to have this recording, to have this conversation, um, for you to, to see clients all over the world 
Um, so, okay, well, let's wrap it up there. I am very jealous of your setup and I'm only a few years behind you, I can promise. Um, You're welcome any time, Leanne. Yeah, well, I might take you up on that. Um, Alessandro, thank you so much for your time. I will link to, um, to everything that we've mentioned and to your yeah. websites and in the, um, if there's anything else you want to send me, I will link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very welcome. It's been a pleasure. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the show. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, help us to reach more people by leaving a rating and a review on iTunes. We would really appreciate that and it would help us to spread the good word even further. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you on the next show.